But every now and then you got to shift. I was kidding with Sig, and we were talking, we were trying to get, Matt was trying to get the lights going. He said the disciples didn't have this problem. They didn't have sound guys. They didn't have light guys. They didn't have, you know, web guys. They didn't have anything. But we do. And we need to max out the efficiency that God has for us in our lifetime. We only have, we only have a loop to go. You know, you have a lifetime to go. I was looking at pictures the other day when we had little kids. It seems like a different world. Some of you, your kids are grown, you got grand. Didn't it seem like a different world you lived in back then? It doesn't even seem like really that was a reality. You're just looking at pictures of it. Because life now is so different. I'm going to tell you something. Life in the spirit is going to be like that. You're going to look back to that prophetic word that Cheryl gave in October and Chuck gave a prophetic word about how things were shifting and changing. You're going to look back and say, wow. That looks like a different church. That, the authority, I love that song, the authority, he's, the authority in the church was there, but it's growing. We have a greater measure of authority being released to us. And we just got to figure out how to, how to yield to it, how to grab onto it, how to, how to function in it. Look at your neighbor and say, I have an unction to function. <laughs> Any testimonies? Okay, come on up. The Lord said to let go of the past. It is past. Let go of remorse. Let go of trying to retaliate. Let go of trying to relive the past. It is bygone, he said. Take hold of what is present. Take hold of what remains. For what is in your hand is your seed for the future. Place that seed with love in the foundation of hope. And gather all your faith to believe for your future to come to pass. Amen. Be strong in me, says the Lord. Be strong. And if you feel weak, know that I will come along and lift you up. I will lift you on the wings of an eagle, and I will take you into your future. Know that I was with you in the past. I am with you now, and I will be with you into your future. I am with you always. And that was the first prophecy that had been released here on tippy toes. <laughs> Carol, Carol had to get up here to get up to the top of the mic. <laughs> Got one, Adrian? Come on up. Hi, everybody. Um, just pray that I'm going to summarize this, but I really believe that it may be someone here or someone out there that can really benefit from what I'm going to share. Um, back in, um, I guess it was a few months back, I was just really not feeling like myself. And, um, and I was praying, and I said, God, I said, I just feel like um, something's not right, you know. Um, there was so much going on, you know, with, in our country, just, just in the world, you know, with just so many voices, so much, not, you know, nonsense, so much coming at you, and you're trying to really hear God. Because that's what I, I told him. I said, God, I need to hear you. I need to hear your voice. I need you to speak to me. I told him, I said, God, I, I feel like I need a redo. And I told him just like that. I said, I feel like I need a redo. There's, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I feel like this. I said, but I just really feel like I need a redo. I'm just tired of all these voices. I'm tired of all the different stuff and things that's being said. I, I was just, I just come to like the end. And um, I was ho laying home in the bed. And like I said, I'm going to summarize this. And, I, and, and, and then I realized, and I believe the Lord spoke to me. It was depression. It was a spirit of depression that was trying to attack me. And I laid there, and, 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 and like I said, I had been praying, and I'd just been talking to the Lord, and, 
And I was about ready to throw the baby out with the bath water. That's just where I was. And um, I started reading the Psalms. And I just read, I just picked different ones out to, to read. And then I got to, I think it was like the last one, and I was reading, it was, a, it was Psalms 139. And I tell you, the Lord entered that room, into my bedroom. And something came over me, and I know that it was broken, whatever it was that was trying to take hold of me. And I mean, it, it, it was it just unbelievable. And I, and I kept trying to read, and, and it just was like something that started pouring out of me. And I believe that that was my redo. The next morning when I got up, I have never felt as good as I have, have in a long time because I know that God touched me. And I can remember singing this song, you know, the next day, he touched me. Oh, he touched me, and all oh, the joy that flood my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me, and he made me whole. Amen. Anybody else? Check. <laughs> Shirley Goodness's turn. Doesn't she look good? <laughs> and trust me, it costs a lot of money to keep her that way. Come on. so good to be here with everybody. We miss being with people, so thank you for coming and just being here. And I just love Dee's mask, because she always looks like she's smiling. I think we need to put a big smiley face on our masks. Well, you know, I spoke a couple weeks ago on the Wednesday night, uh, or Sunday night, about the people that I felt had really changed Moses' life. Re remember I talked about that if you were on the Zoom class. And I'm just going to go over that briefly. Uh, I felt like the midwives uh, were part of those people, his mother and father, uh, the princess, his sister Miriam, and then also um, his brother Aaron paid a played a ma major part in his life, and his father-in-law, Jethro. These were, there were six people that really, that God spoke to me about, and I feel like this is a season where we are going to identify these people in our life, those that God puts in our pathway to help us along the way, but also that we are going to be those people. You know, it's not just about who can help us? I, I was talking to Adrienne tonight before the service, and I said, it's not really about us. It, you know, it can be about us, but we have to go beyond ourselves and begin to look out and say, okay, you've given me this experience. You're allowing this to happen. How can I be that for someone else? So tonight, I'm going to talk about what it really means to be a midwife and what it really means to be a mother and a father. Because if we're going to identify these people in our process or become that in someone else's process, we need to know what it is. Are we, are we really that? And so, uh, Lord, I just pray that this word would penetrate us. It would help us to see up and over the wall, to see beyond ourselves, and to see the greater picture of what is ahead because you have a hope and a future for us. Now, these midwives that, that uh, were talked about in the Bible, they're still here today. There's midwives, that there's a big resurgence in, in midwifery, and most of the time it is women that are doing this, but there are male midwives. It, it isn't gender specific. What does a midwife do? Um, you know, what is, what is the 
what is the call of the profession of a midwife? It's to birth a baby, but it to help birth a baby, the mother births a baby, to assist in the birthing of the baby, but there's a lot more to it than that. Midwives go through training. They, they, uh, some of them are nurses, some of them aren't. But some of the things that, that are required of them is they help the pregnant mother during the pregnancy. They don't just deliver the baby. They check on the mother's health throughout the nine months of pregnancy. They check on the baby's health. They check on the growth of the baby. They check on the position of the baby. I mean, you know, there's a lot that they have to see and identify with the pregnant woman. You know, how is this pregnancy moving forward? Are there any health issues? Are there any um, uh, nutrition issues or, or outside things that are influencing the emotional health of the mother during the pregnancy. I mean, there's a lot of things. Sometimes if someone is going to birth something new, there is a lot of changes that are happening in that person's life. You know, they're, they are, a lot of times they're in transition from something that was good yesterday and they're transitioning to something into something they don't even know what it's gonna look like. They don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Well, I mean, today you can with ultrasound, but you get what I'm saying to you. When we're going to birth something new, we don't know what the new is. Most of the time, we may have an inkling. And so there's all of this drama, there's all of this unknown that's going on with a person that's getting ready to birth the new. Midwives in the spirit are able to come alongside of that person and help them hear God for the next step. They can hear God for the next step. They can, they, they're, in, they're in intercession. They are in travail. They are having groans that cannot be uttered, praying for this person that's getting ready to birth something brand new. It is a form of intercession that requires a lot of uh, expense of your emotion. A lot of your uh, physical well-being sometimes is turned into that midwifery or that intercession for this person that's getting ready to give birth. You know, your own nutrition needs to be cared for and that type of thing. You get up in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock and you're praying till 4 or 5 in the morning, you know, or whatever. Or you're having to skip meals because God's saying, you know, you need to fast right now for this. This here is getting ready to be born. It's in the growth. It's in the birthing process. You need to not eat right now. I mean, there's things that God says to us. We need to give into it. You know, midwifery, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but to be a midwife, uh, it reminds me a little bit of the friend of the bridegroom. Remember John the Baptist was the friend of the bridegroom? He said, I'm not the bridegroom. That's him. That's Jesus. But I'm his friend. I am preparing the way for this new covenant relationship to take place. Well, a, a midwife is like that, only we're preparing the way for the birth of the new. And, and it's, a, it's a selfless call. It's a call that's not really about you, but it's about what God is getting ready to do, the friend of the bridegroom. What the friend of the bridegroom does is make sure that every single thing is perfect for when that bride and groom come together. And then they're out of the picture. It, the Bible says they stand and hear, they stand and listen to the first words that the bride and groom have with each other upon their first coming together. I mean, that's what it, that is very much like what a midwife does. A midwife helps the mother or the one birthing with the important decisions that have to be put in place. Will I have the baby at home? Will I have it at the hospital? Will I have it in another country? I mean, who knows where the baby's going to be born? Sometimes you're pregnant with something in the spirit, and it might not come forth until next year, and you might be in Russia. The midwife gives uh, advice and support. Sometimes we have to advise 
give advice to people that are getting ready. We discern that there is something getting ready to be birthed. And listen, it may not just be a person getting ready to be, give birth. It may be a ministry that's pregnant and getting ready to give birth. It may be a nation that's pregnant and ready to give birth. You know, whenever something new is getting ready to come forth, it can be in the economy. We've got to see the bigger picture here about what it's really like to be a midwife in the Lord's army. And so... We can, give, uh, we can give support and advice. Now, we've got to have what it takes to do that. We've got to be educated ourselves. We've got to be prepared. Now, can God give you something by revelation? Absolutely, and he does. But the prep preparation is never harmful in our life. The midwife helps prepare for the upcoming labor and birth has everything there that's going to be needed during that time, has the numbers uh, uh, on, her, on his or her phone if they need to call for added medical attention or if something happens and they need to call an ambulance. They're prepared. They have things in place to the best of their ability to prepare for this birth. That's what a midwife does. That's, this is before the birth. They have a good relationship with the birthing mother and the father and the family, the other children that may be in the family. It's, it's very relational. It's just not some stone-cold thing that comes in and says, oh, you're having a baby, great, d d d d d you know, this, 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 and this. It's not like a hospital setting. It, it, a relationship forms with a midwife that usually doesn't happen with a more sterile hospital type of birth. And so midwives are people that know how to build relationships with a very hormonal woman. <laughs> and isn't the church likened to a woman, God's bride? And so let's think of it in this respect. John's not saying anything. Um, because it's very important that during those times when things are getting ready to change, that we have grace for one another. We have grace for those that are getting ready to give birth. And that relationship is, is held in very high esteem and very important in our lives so that these relationships are not broken or ruined or hurt comes. I mean, it's very key. Um, a mid, and, so, and so that's the pre-birth. Pre so then the day comes and the, and the baby uh, is getting ready to come and the wife goes into labor. Labor is painful. I mean, every once in a while you can have a baby with no pain. I did, Jonathan was practically painless. It was a miracle I didn't have him in the car. Uh, but the rest of his life made up for it. But the rest of his life made up for it. There's a truth in that somehow. Another sermon someday. But anyway, um, uh, so labor comes, and labor is painful. Sometimes labor is all in the front of your stomach. Sometimes it's in, just in your back. But I can tell you when those labor pains come, it hurts. It hurts. And you usually don't like the person that got you in that condition. <laughs> There's things that go through your mind with your hormones all wacky. You don't like the doctor. You tell him to get out. Trisha Roselli told her husband to punch the doctor in the face. Because, you know, you're, you're in a state. You're in a state of giving birth. It is right then and there. You've got extreme pain, then no pain at all. You're scared of what's going to happen. There's all these things, and the midwife is there to bring encouragement and support during that time. Everybody can't do that. You know, uh, everybody can't do it. Some people, you just say, would you get out of here and leave me alone? <laughs> Other people can come in and really bring that comfort and support that you need. And so during the birth of something new, 
again, just like, in, just like during the pregnancy, we've got to give people much grace because things are changing rapidly. Tra things change rapidly during the birthing process. Um, they monitor the progress of the labor. They monitor how it's going. Is it, is it going like it should? Is it happening in a timely manner? Are there any other issues? Are the, is the mother's blood pressure too high? Is it too low? I mean, there's, there's all these things that we have to have a keen eye. Think about past revivals. When they began to happen, or past moves of God, boom, they came onto the surface. They just happen. They just happen, we think, but there's a birthing process to that. And during that birthing process, many people leave the church because they don't have it in them to withstand the changes that are happening. They don't even understand it. But the people that the changes are happening in don't understand it either. And we need to give people grace. We need to give each other a break during that. So they monitor the progress. They suggest strategies to help the labor progress properly. So there's, a, there's an aspect in midwives of great wisdom. They know, they discern, they're discerners of the times and seasons. They know what time it is in that birth. They know what, they know what season it is in that, in that uh, labor. Is it the first, second, or third, third uh, tri or transition, the transition period in labor? Where, where is this at? They monitor the baby's heartbeat. Is this thing that is being birthed alive? Is it in trouble? Is there something that's causing uh, the heartbeat to race quickly? And, and the, baby, the baby needs help. We need to get this baby out quicker. You know, they monitor all that. They're watching over what's being birthed, even though they aren't really sure what it's going to look like. They get that by revelation. You know, we always go back to the, the word and the testimony when, you know, we hear God, but it has to line up with the word of God. And so if we know the word, we can discern properly if we're filled with the spirit. So we're able to discern what's happening. Is it good? Is it bad? Do we need to call extra help in here? Does there need to be more finances? Does there need to be more out? You know, what is it? Do we need more hot water? <laughs> is there pain medication that's needed? This is all the things that the midwives are looking at. Do we need extra help? Do we need to call in the church from down the road to help us with what's going on here? Do we have to lay down our pride and say we need help? Remember in the Bible they had to call all those other boats in because the fish were too many for them. And listen, these other boats have to lay down their pride and say, you know what, I'm giving up what I have here because I see something being birthed here and I'm going to be a part of it. Midwives. This is what midwives do. So you will be able to know if that's your calling or you will be able to discern, is this person a midwife in my life or, the, or are they out for themselves? We need to know that stuff. After the baby is born, the midwife cares for both the mother and the baby right after birth, immediately after birth. They, they check the mother's vital signs. They make sure that extra medical attention isn't needed. Did the mother lose too much blood? Is she lethargic? How is the baby? Does the baby pass all the... Uh, life-sustaining tests that they have to take the baby through. They, I mean, in the hospital, they call it the APGAR test. But, do, you know, is the baby breathing properly? Is his color pink and lively? Does he have a good cry? You know, is his heartbeat normal? Does he have all the parts? You know, I mean, all of these things, the, the midwife right after the birth has to check all these things out to see if extra help is needed or to see if something 
needs to be changed in the care of this new infant and the mother that just gave birth. They instruct the new mother on how to feed and care for the baby. Midwives' jobs don't stop at the birth. They are with that mother for usually the next month, coming and visiting a couple times a week. They're training that mother, if the mother doesn't already know, if this is a new baby, how to feed that baby properly. When you're feeding it, do you have issues during feeding, nursing the baby? Uh, how to change, some people don't know how to change diapers. Listen, when you've got a new thing, birth is going to have some diapers, let me tell you. And you're going to need to change them. And you're going to need to know how to change them and what to do. Okay? Um, it, it, it teaches them, the midwife teaches them how to bathe the new baby. How to take care of the umbilical cord when you cut it off. You know, there's a process with that umbilical cord. There's a big scab on that baby's belly button that has to be cared for a certain way. Think about it. When a, something is born and that umbilical cord is cut, what needed the mother now has a life of its own. And so there's transitions here that, you know, we need to look at as midwives. There's a lot to it. Um... And so that's what happens after the birth. Until they are confident that that baby is secure and the mother is secure, they stay and help for a couple weeks, you know, coming in and out, and then they leave and go on to their next client. And so, Lord, I just release right now a midwife anointing. I decree tonight that we will... Know and understand in ourselves what midwife means to us. That we will discern midwives in our life, but we will also discern when we're to be that gift to somebody else's life. And we would do it without reserve. That it wouldn't be about us, but it would be about what you are birthing in the earth. In Jesus' mighty name. Now... The next thing that the Lord spoke to me was the mothering and the fathering. You know, the midwife's gone, and now it is the job of the mother and father to raise this baby. It takes both to raise a child pop properly. Can you do it as a single parent? Absolutely, but it's a lot harder. And what do I mean by mothering and fathering? Paul writes in Galatians 4.19, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Intercession, personal ministry, and deliverance are part of what a mother and father do in the new baby's life. Whether it's a brand new Christian that's just been born again or a brand new ministry, there's kinks to work out in that person or in that ministry. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. And so Paul says here, he travailed that they would be saved, but then he began to travail again as a father to make sure that Christ was formed in them. And travail means to experience the pains of labor and birthing, literally or figuratively, which the mother does when she has the baby. That's why we need the midwife. And to be formed, Christ to be formed in someone means to get as a section or an allotment. In other words, he's He's, as a father now, travailing in prayer to make sure that Christ gets every part of you that is his allotment. You just don't get somebody saved and leave them off to the devil. They need to be discipled. Christ needs to be formed in them. Christ needs to obtain his full allotment. It took three and a half years for his disciples, and they were grown men who followed the law. 
And even after three and a half years, he was still tweaking them. He, you know, we know ourselves. He does this. Um, God, the father, is our pattern. When we father and mother, that's our pattern. God is known as the many-breasted one. I mean, he's, he has the aspects of both father and mother. He nurtures us. He feeds us. He disciplines us. He keeps us safe. He uh, trains us up in the way that we should go. He sends people into our life. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says, But when the proper time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born subject to the regulations of the law, to purchase the freedom of those who were subject to the law, that's us, that we might be adopted and have sonship conferred upon us and be recognized as God's son. First of all, he loved us so much that he gave. Fathers and mothers give, give, give until there ain't no more to give. That's the first thing that a father and a mother do. They give love. They give uh, comfort. They give safety. They give a house. You know, they give a house. They give all of those things. And because you really are his sons, God then sent the Holy Spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God didn't stop giving in Christ. He then gave Holy Spirit. Amen. And now he gives you as a gift to other people. Is this exciting? Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then it follows that you are an heir by the aid of God through Christ. Everything that is God's is ours. Everything. Can you stand up? Just stand up. I want you to step into everything right now. Step into it by faith. Everything. Say it. Do it again. Everything has to be born. Everything. 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 There is not one thing that belongs to God that does that hit not his glory, but all the promises, all the things that God has belong to us. But we just have to step into the everything. Now, Romans 8, 14, and 14 through 16. Because this goes right along with this, right after this. So we've received the Holy Spirit. We're the joint heirs. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. God sent his Spirit so that we can be led by the Spirit and be the sons of God. It's the only way. It's the only way. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Listen, this is the good news. This is the good news of, of the gospel. Father loved us so much that he gave. And he has not stopped giving. He's not stopped giving. We are reconciled to the Father by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to be reconciled to one another. There's things that can prevent us from walking ahead fully in, son in the manifestation of sonship. And we need to let those things go in this season. Parents, nurture, feed, and protect. I was never afraid of anything when I was little, when my dad was with me. 
never afraid. The one time I remember being afraid was when he, when he did not get home out of the bay when he was supposed to one night, and it was dark, and he did, wasn't home, he wasn't home. And my mom didn't say anything, but I knew she was worried, you know, because he'd go out in the bay by himself. I was little, and I remember at the time um, uh, standing by the back door and crying, waiting for his pickup truck lights to come in that driveway. That's the one time as a child I remember being afraid. But when he was with me, I was never afraid. Um, as, newborn, as, as newborn babies, um, we need milk. And then we need solid food. So mothers and fathers know when to give milk, and they know when to change that food into more solid, substantial meals. They know, they know when to begin potty training. They know when to be able to take you out to dinner with them. You know, there's different things that mothers and fathers need to identify in their children. God identifies it in us, but we are called, you are called, to begin to identify those needs or those transition periods in other people's lives. And we can speak into that and bring the training that is needed. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. He's talking to baby Christians that had just been saved in a great revival. Desire the milk of the word. The word, the word, the word has to get in you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. They are, mothers and fathers are constantly discerning where you are in your spiritual walk, not for their own gratification, not for their own purpose, but for you, for you to be all that you can be to be nutritionally sound in the things of God. The, they, Peter said, listen, sometimes we're going to say these things over and over and over again to you because it's always good to be reminded of what I said in the first place. We can never get to a point where we, don't, where we think we don't need to hear it again. Hebrews 5.13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So the, the aspect of how do we eat, we need, to, we, need to be, we need to be mothers and fathers and discern these things. Now, how do mothers and fathers discern it? With love. They don't walk up to somebody and tell them what a jerk they are and how they should be not eating this anymore, but they need to be eating that. They do it, they do it all with, with an aspect of love and caring for that person, that child. You know, when we are discipling people, when we're caring for people as a mother or father in the Lord or midwife, midwifing, they're God's children. And we will answer for the way that we are caring for them. We'll answer if we're caring for them in love or if we're caring for them in harshness. Mothers and fathers supply emotional support and comfort. Third John 1, 2, this is the Apostle John. So we've talked about Peter. We've talked about God the Father. We've talked about the Apostle Paul. This is this is the Apostle John. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Your emotions, your personality, all the things about you that are you, the inside stuff. John says, I wish above all things that you prosper in your physical body and in your emotions. God is not without emotion. 
He did not create us to be emotionless. But we have to learn through a process of discipleship how to rein in our emotions, how not to get angry. We, we can be angry and sin not. How not to be lustful. I mean, there's a process for all of these things in our soul where mothers and fathers train their children how to have control over those things in their life, their desires, their emotions. And, and it's, it's by the word of God and, and yielding to the word of God that we've got to be discipled into that. That's what mothers and fathers do. Um, 3 John 1, 3. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, even as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And so as mothers and fathers, we discern where people are in their, in their learning experience, in their being trained up, in their emotional support, we discern that by how they're walking it out. And we can be people that see, okay, they're saying this, but they're doing this. You get what I'm saying? Mothers and fathers, we need to see that stuff, and we need to deal with it appropriately. Mothers and fathers train up their children. And, I'm, and these are some, uh, some of my favorite scriptures. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We need to train our children. We need to train the, the uh, young converts coming in. We need to train the old converts. I need to be trained. I get trained. I'm still being trained. Honestly, I love our alignment with Glory of Zion because I'm being trained. We never outgrow the need to be trained. Proverbs 1.8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. We have to continue to hear our mothers and fathers in the faith and not discount them. Why? Because they have wisdom. They have life wisdom. That if you're a young convert, you ain't got it. You may have knowledge, but you don't have the wisdom that has come through life experience of walking out all these things with the Lord. That's why it's a, God is a tri-generational God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You need all three generations to be speaking the same thing so that we can arise and shine for our light has come. Second Titus 3.16. I know I'm going a little longer tonight than I usually do. I hope that's okay. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness to the word and to the testimony. We need to be people of the word. Um, because, and Sig and Ginger and John and I talked about this last night. We can't allow someone's experience to trump the word of God in our life. Right. You got people out there on YouTube now that have, have had experiences they're talking about all their supernatural experiences. I've had supernatural experiences. I believe in them. But let me tell you something. Nothing trumps what God has spoken to you. And you know that it's true. I mean, you get counsel with your elders. But don't let someone else's supposed experience change your path. That guy did it in the Old Testament, remember? God said, go prophesy that the altar will be rent. And he said, don't you, and prophesy about Josiah and don't you, don't, don't hang around. Don't eat, don't take money, and you go back this way. Some old guy shows up and says, oh, an angel came to my house and told me that you're supposed to come home and have dinner with me. Now, the guy 
The one guy was a young prophet that gave the word that was confirmed instantly. The altar rent, and then the king tried to kill him, and the king's hand shriveled up, and then he prayed for the king, and the king's hand was healed. Powerful manifestation of a confirmation that that word that was given was God Almighty. And then 400 years later, Josiah shows up, prophesied by that same man. But he allowed an older person's experience to change or trump the word of God in his life. Don't do it. I don't care if they say they've seen an angel or they've been to heaven 10 million times. That doesn't discount what God has said to you. Hear me on that. It's very dangerous. Be, why is it dangerous? Because in America today, we're fascinated. We're fascinated. That's not faith. Faith is not fascination. I won't go any further on that. I'm being kind. But I'm, I'm just, but it's scary because I've seen so many people taken out like that. They allowed an ex someone else's experience to take them off their path. And they never got counsel. They just did it. Discipline. Parents give discipline. Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now, as mothers and fathers in the church, we're not going to be like Singapore and beat you with a rod. They use a cane. They cane you. Uh, but, but discipline has to be given by mothers and fathers in the faith. Mothers and fathers still get disciplined. Because if we are not accountable to somebody, we will, human nature, you just go, you go end up doing what you want to do. Doesn't matter how famous you are or how smart you are or how big your ministry is. We need to be accountable. And we need to be corrected and disciplined. Proverbs 23, 12. Apply your mind to instruction and correction and your ears to words of knowledge. So what is that saying? We have to purposely turn our ear to correction and discipline, not turn away from it and rebel. Proverbs 23, 13. Withhold not discipline from the child, for if you strike and punish him with the reed like rod, he will not die. We save them. Proverbs 23, 14. You shall whip him with the rod and deliver his life from hell, the place of the dead. So correction and discipline are things that do need to take place in the church. It's not not hitting somebody you know what I'm saying this is I'm not saying that I'm just saying we have to yield our ear and our heart to correction and discipline when it comes uh, we provide shelter parents provide shelter from the storm we provide shelter from the elements we provide a loving atmosphere where people feel loved accepted and um, in, enjoyed you know what I'm saying they're not tolerated they're not just tolerated they're enjoyed and that's what a family does uh, Proverbs 31 27 and 28 and this is talking about the, the Proverbs 31 woman but it's talking about how the household runs and how the family of God runs okay it's not just a wife but think about us as the bride of Christ, okay? She looks well to how things go in her household. And the bread of idleness, gossip, discontent, and self-pity, she will not eat. Just say, I'm not going to eat that. As a mother and a father, I'm not going to eat that. Her children rise up and call her blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied. And her husband boasts of and praises her. That's God boasting and praising of us because we have run our household, the house of God that has been given into our care. We've run it well. 
We've done these things as a mother and father. So I bless you tonight. I say you will be people that will also stimulate intellectual growth and preparedness in your children that God gives you. You know, my dad taught me how to shine shoes, something I've never forgotten. He taught me how to pick potato bugs off of potato plants, how to plant a garden, how to fix certain things. I couldn't be a mechanic because I was a girl, but my mom taught me how to clean a house. You would be surprised at the number of women who have never been taught how to clean a house properly. I've been in some of them. Never taught how to clean a toilet, how to clean out the refrigerator every once in a while. I mean, honestly, how to wipe down the inside of your cabinets, how to, I, there's just people that have never been taught that because the mother in their life didn't know how to do it. How people weren't taught how to have a work ethic because the parents didn't have a work ethic. They weren't taught how to save money or give money or go to church. So a mother and a father in the Lord is very important. And you're going to be that. Some of you are already. Some of you are in the process of becoming that. We need to know these things, to discern them in our life. Listen, if, if somebody says they're a father or a mother in my life and they don't act like Jesus, they ain't my mother and father. Because that's not the daddy I know. This is how we discern. It's how we discern. So stand up. I'm going to bless you. Lord, I bless the mothers and fathers in this room and on this broadcast. Those of us that are doing it, those of us that are being in training to do it, we're all in different uh, times of growth in that, but I bless that gift. And I say to this body here tonight, you be blessed in your mother and mothering and fathering. You be blessed in your midwifery. You be blessed in what God has called you to do. You submit. I decree over you a spirit of submission to the mothers and fathers God has put in your lives. You may have several, but I, I, I release that blessing. And Lord, I say that that blessing will fall on this house tonight and on every house that's watching this, Lord God, every church or ministry that's watching this. I loose it tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to share, just sit down for one minute. It'll be a couple minutes. Cheryl spoke on Shabbat. How many of you saw the Shabbat message with Gloria Zion? If you get the chance to watch the replay, go ahead. But she talked about the midwife on there a little bit. And we got an email, was it to this morning? From Russia. A messenger. Facebook thing. From a 30-year-old woman in Russia. And she saw Cheryl's message on Shabbat from Glory of Zion that went to over 100 countries. And she contacted Cheryl and said, 30 years ago, a midwife saved my life because my mother was going to abort me. And she brought me into this world and made sure that I was born. Now, what I want to say to you is, I want you to start to feel, not just understand how things are shifting. See, this isn't just about this it's, 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 it's going to be bigger than that. I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about the impact in the spirit realm that you and I are destined to make before we stand before him. All of us. And, you know, I can't tell you over the years, how long we've been at this, 45 years, how many times leaders have pulled me aside and said, you need to get your wife under control. I'm telling you, right? I'm telling you the truth. See, 
Now, her perspective, nobody can teach you about mothering better than her because she was a great mother. But see, we all see things, and Chuck told on it today, you might want to watch the replay about perspective. See, my perspective comes from a different angle with things. And I mean, we just had a Super Bowl. Tom Brady was the MVP. Do you know why the Buccaneers beat the Chiefs? Excuse me? Scored more points? Why? The Chiefs' two biggest offensive linemen, tackles, were hurt and didn't play. Their quarterback got hit, hurried, rushed over 30 times. Brady's line was intact. And he was able to stand back. If he's not open, he's, oh, he's open. Mahomes was running around like a chicken with his head cut off. We got to have, now Cheryl talked to you a little bit about mothering. We got to have an offensive lineman type perspective. I got to protect what God is doing. I got to knock down anything that's trying to come and knock down what God is doing. And, and you don't do it physically. It's, it's, it's in an intercession. Now, Brady was named the MVP. I remember when Troy Aikman was named the MVP, he bought every one of his linemen Rolex watches. Because he knew if it wasn't for them, he wouldn't have been able to throw a pass. There are so many people that are connected when God moves that are just, they all going to get a ring, are just as valuable, just as important as the person standing up here. It's a network of support. It's a network of encouragement. It's a network of discipline, network of rebuke. Sometimes People rebuke you. you look, you, that was wrong what you did. And you've got to humble yourself and say, you're right. I shouldn't have done or said or whatever. Have an, not just a mothering aspect, but what some of you guys, have an offensive lineman. Everybody wants to be the quarterback or the wide receiver that catches an 80-yard touchdown pass. Nobody wants to stand there within a three-yard period and get their toes stepped on every other play and bruised all over their body. Because that, that's what offensive linemen do. And so, Father, right now, I just lose the ability to run as a removal of any obstacle for the Spirit of God to have his way. Lord, show us how to partner with you, just like a lineman. Show us how to remove obstacles. L l let someone else run through the hole that we open up sometimes, Lord. And, and let them get their MVP. Let them get the trophy. Lord, as long as we win. We want the kingdom of God to win in our country and our world. Lord, whoever that Russian girl was who was saved by the midlife, we bless her right now. We may not ever meet her on this side. But Lord, thank you for that message reaching all the way across the world. And we just lose the ability to reach there is no limitation in the spirit realm in the world, in distance. We can right here tonight with a broadcast reach all the way across the world. And so, Father, open up our eyes to that dimension in Jesus' name. Be blessed, everybody. It's been wonderful.